This is the first uh, in a short series on our uh, innate and adaptive immunity. And we're going to start with the innate immune system. <clears throat> innate, by definition, means inborn. So this is something we, we start off life with, more or less. Some things change, of course, throughout development, but uh, it's, it's nonspecific. That's another way to think of innate immunity. It's a nonspecific immunity. It really doesn't care what the pathogen is, for the most part. It's just going to attempt to block uh, any and all foreign things from having access to more vulnerable parts of our body. <clears throat> We're going to break down the innate immune system into two lines of defense. Our first line of defense represents our skin, uh, the various mucous membranes that line certain tracts, and then our normal microbiota, our resident flora. We've talked about that already. So we'll just sort of remind ourselves of where those fit in in the context of, uh, of nonspecific immunity. Our second line of defense, assuming a pathogen gets past that first line of defense, includes phagocytosis, so uh, phagocytic white blood cells devouring those pathogens, still non-specifically. Non they don't really care if it's E. coli or salmonella. They just know that it's foreign and they're consuming it. Some, um, some immune chemicals complement, which is produced by the liver, and uh, interferon as well, which is extremely important in... Uh, in antiviral activity, it plays a big role in fighting viral infections. <clears throat> and then finally, we'll touch on inflammation and fever and what their possible roles are in uh, our innate defenses. In this first video, we're going to focus our attention on the skin as an innate first line of defense. So here we go uh, in this, this image here, you're seeing uh, a little bit more specifically what we were just talking about with that first line of defense with skin, mucous membranes, and normal flora. Mucous membranes specifically are lining the gastrointestinal tract, the urogenital tract, and the respiratory tract. Those are very vulnerable places, and we'll talk about those in the next video, and then our normal flora. And pay specific attention to uh, the distinctions I make between mechanical factors that are protecting us and chemical factors that are protecting us. So let's look at the skin. Let's start with some mechanical barriers. You can see in this image here, the skin is a multi-layered structure. <clears throat> the topmost layer is uh, dead cells, and these cells, prior to their death, have built up a, a very massive network of cytoskeletal keratin proteins, keratin fibers, and as the cells die, the keratin doesn't degrade. So essentially what you've got is this armor covering your whole body. So take a minute while we're talking here and look at your arm, and imagine on your arm a thin, essentially invisible, layer of dead cells and a, a mesh network, almost like a, almost like a spider web of keratin, tough, um, tough fibers of protein coating you. You've got a thin armor all the way around you, and that's a really important piece of this whole puzzle. Below that, you have the living tissue, the dermal layer, epidermal and dermal layer. And in the epidermis, you can see that uh, the non-keratinized uh, region, we start to get into some live cells, and the dermis is where you've got actively growing cells uh, deeper down. And those are more vulnerable to infection because they're alive, and so uh, we're, we're trying to protect those. So what are some of the mechanical barriers? They're very, very tightly packed together with very few gaps, and so that makes it difficult for pathogens to get across. <clears throat> the keratinization forms this, this armor webbing that we've talked about, as well as dead cells. The dead cells are continuously sloughing off, they're shedding. In fact, if you ever sit down on your couch at home and you get a big poof of dust, most of that dust is dead skin cells, constantly shedding off, and any, any microbes that are attached to them shed off with them. So we've got this outermost layer that is constantly being removed, along with microbes that are being removed. And then from a microscope, microscopic perspective, um, this is a very, it's a desert, uh, the skin is. Very dry, very salty, uh, and there are little oases all along the way. Uh, oases in the form of uh, sweat glands and sebaceous or oil glands and hair follicles. Little areas where there's a little bit of moisture, a little bit of nutrients, and possibly a place for microbes to actually access a little bit deeper tissues uh, if they were attempting to, to infect us. Another mechanical barrier is sweat from those sweat glands, and to some degree the oil secretion, so that's much less force and much slower, but as sweat moves away from those sweat glands, it flushes pathogens out and away from those vulnerable little structures. We do know, however, that our skin is in fact quite vulnerable to staphylococcal opportunists. 
<clears throat> in particular staph aureus. Now there are also some chemical barriers associated with the skin. The oil, which is called sebum, that's produced by the sebaceous or oil glands, contains fatty acids in it. And these fatty acids are toxic to fungi, think molds, think yeasts, and to some bacteria, um, just directly chemically, and then also the fatty acids, as acids, lower the pH. Uh, so even though the skin is relatively dry, what little moisture is available of lower pH, just not a great happy place for most microbes. We know that uh, Staphylococci, especially Staphylococcus epidermidis, does a great job of coloni colonizing us uh, commensally or potentially mutualistically without causing infection most of the time. And in part, that's because they can handle the high salts, they can handle the dry, they can handle the exposure to UV, uh, and they can handle the slightly lowered pH as well. Now, that's in the oil. In sweat, produced by the sweat glands, we have two different classes of uh, antimicrobial compounds. We have lysozyme, which is an enzyme, a protein enzyme, that lyses uh, gram-positive cells by attacking the peptidoglycan and chewing it up. And so this lysozyme keeps the overall count of gram positives on our skin relatively low. And then we've got a set of, of molecules called defensins. And defensins are proteins that are antimicrobial in some general sense. On our skin, we have a defensin called dermicidin. Okay, derm from skin and sidin from killing. So it is there to generally, generically, non-specifically kill microbes, particularly bacteria, that get on our skin. So our skin has both um, uh, chemical barriers as well as physical barriers that are constantly protecting us, arguably our first and most important uh, innate line of defense. Now there are some cellular barriers associated with the skin. Technically these are part of the second line of defense. They only start to act if those first two lines of defense are somehow breached, like by a, a needle stick or through a, a hair follicle or something like that. These cellular barriers come in the form of something called dendritic cells. Dendritic cells are phagocytic cells that are not white blood cells. They're not produced um, as part of the, the blood production process. They are phagocytic, and they're integrated among the epidermal cells. We're going to see dendritic cells elsewhere as well, but they're down in those deeper layers that are living. So in the slide on the right, you can see the epidermis. That's dark purple in the dermis. And we have these dendritic cells scattered throughout there. And their job is just to kind of sit there as, um, as a soldier, you know, as a guard, uh, constantly sampling things that come in. And if they sample something, they, and when I say sample, I mean they phagocytose it and they digest it. If they sample something that appears to be non-cell, <clears throat> they will then slowly but surely crawl to the nearest lymphatic vessel, work their way very slowly to the nearest lymph node, and present those fragments, those bits and pieces of that pathogen, to our adaptive immune system, our T cells and B cells. We haven't talked about those yet. And essentially ask them, do we want to start a war here? Is, is this a problem? I saw something that didn't look like self. Uh, would you agree, and should we do something about it? So these dendritic cells become really essential as a bridge between the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. So we'll put this cellular barrier in here for now, just as sort of a plug, keeping in mind we'll come back to it again when we talk about uh, when we talk about the adaptive system. So let's finish this video with a quick concept check. Uh, when I'm done talking, go ahead and just freeze this video, read this question, think it through carefully. If you've got a buddy that you're watching this video with, you know, you're just sitting there with popcorn and in your PJs and enjoying a nice uh, microbiology movie night, trade back and forth answering these questions that I'm going to be showing you in these videos. So work through this concept check. If there's anything you missed, go back and listen to the video again. And be sure to be keeping up with the reading and taking notes as you go along.